If there's one thing I didn't know I needed this year, it's an action RPG by a renowned studio known for making incredibly rich worlds and telling immersive stories. That's exactly what Moon Studios' upcoming game No Rest for the Wicked is shaping up to be, a dark and gritty fantasy adventure that blends together elements from their previous games and numerous other genres. My name is Kodiak, this is Legacy Gaming, and this is our ultimate preview of No Rest for the Wicked. Moon Studios might not be a household name, but their last two games, Ori and the Blind Forest and Ori and the Will of the Wisps, are two of the most beloved Metroidvania games of the past decade, transforming the genre and setting the bar for every action platformer that came after. That's why when the team announced they were making No Rest for the Wicked, an action RPG, it turned a lot of heads. The game has been in development in earnest since 2018, but the studio has been thinking and slowly working on the game well before that, and on April 18th, 2024, players on Steam will have a chance to go hands-on for the first time as the game launches into early access. Console players will unfortunately have to wait until the inevitable 1.0 release. No Rest for the Wicked is certainly a departure from the Ori games, but there is so much that carries over into this bold new direction for the studio, and now that we've grounded ourselves, it's time to crack things wide open. No Rest for the Wicked takes place in the year 841 on the island of Isola Sacra. The death of the island's king, Harold, has thrown everything into chaos, and political and religious factions are all vying for power in the vacuum left by his death. It's a fascinating backdrop for a team that knows how to tell more abstract stories driven by the environment, but this time around, they'll have to create those moments with characters that are much more relatable and real. We know of supporting characters, like the king's son Magnus, who is unproven and looking to take his father's throne. There's also the magical Selene, a ruthless figure in the church that will become a prominent figure in the game's story. Isola Sacra will also house a variety of rebel groups fighting for control in the backwaters of the island, and all of this will inevitably come to a head. Over top all of this, however, is the rumor of the pestilence, a plague that can transform the mind and body of anyone it infects, turning them into mindless monsters. That's where you, the player, come into the picture. You're a seraph, a holy warrior tasked with purging the pestilence whatever it takes, and while we still don't know much about the origins of the plague and how it's folded into the overall story of the game, we certainly know one of your main tasks is to expunge it from the island. That task will take you across Isola Sacra in ways we can't yet imagine. But if there's one thing we know and we can see from early gameplay footage, it's that Moon Studios' iconic art direction and vivid world building are on full display. The world of Isola Sacra, as far as we know right now, is a dark and dreary place. From what we've seen, this is far from the bright and vivid world of Ori's Wellspring Glades and much more rooted in the dark fantasy we've come to know and appreciate from, say, a Dark Souls game. The team has spent years hand-painting every element of Isola Sacra, and that's apparent from the moment you wake up on its shores. From a gameplay perspective, this manifests in three critical ways. First is the visual design of the world itself. If there's one team that knows how to create a breathtaking world, it's Moon Studios, and I have no doubt that will be the case across the entire island. Second is the fact that No Rest for the Wicked's world is entirely seamless and fully handcrafted. This is a major departure from what players have typically come to expect from ARPGs, which relies heavily on procedurally generated maps built around predetermined themes. No Rest for the Wicked will rely on no such tricks, which means we'll be exploring the same world every time we log in for the foreseeable future. This is certainly going to be an interesting experience, and one I can't wait to see play out. The team has already revealed that a system called Alive will act as a way to keep parts of the world feeling lived in. As players clear an area, eventually they'll become overrun with new enemies. These won't always be the same enemies that previously occupied the area, which gives the developers freedom to massage that system in a given direction based on the feedback from early access. The third way the game's world is going to impact the player's experience is through exploration. After going hands-on with the game, a number of media outlets and content creators talked about how dense the world of Isola Sacra is. You could beeline for a main objective and reach it within a handful of minutes, or you could spend the time to explore every nook and cranny of the world, and some hours later, finally have explored all that there is to see. It's something we can very clearly see in early gameplay footage as players move vertically almost as much as they move horizontally, and that's something the Moon Studios team 
plans on using throughout all of No Rest for the Wicked. We see players climbing up half-destroyed towers, exploring caves, and ultimately using every inch of the explorable map to find secrets and progress their characters. Chances are Moon Studios has hooked you with its gorgeous world design and the game's premise. Truth be told, their work on Ori has helped solidify them as some of the best world builders currently in the industry. But that doesn't mean they get a free pass when it comes to gameplay systems, which is something our channel focuses on a lot. And for the rest of this video, we're going to dive into what we know about No Rest for the Wicked and how it actually plays, and what players can expect when they fire up the game on day one of early access. As I mentioned before, you play as a Serum, and because the game is a fantasy RPG, things will start with you creating a character. There's definitely a stylized look to your avatar, and as is often the case with dark fantasy games, I find that character customization doesn't really matter all that much, mainly because you'll be wearing armor that covers up a majority of your body. Still, having customization options is nice and does allow players to feel truly unique within the world. Once you wash ashore Isola Sacra, you'll quickly realize that No Rest for the Wicked isn't like every other action RPG you've played before. The first major difference is the camera angle, which yes, is top down, but widened and curved to give players a better view of things in the background. Given everything we've talked about from a world building perspective, you can see why this is such an important factor. The second major difference is that the game isn't point and click. All movement is done with WASD on a keyboard or with a controller, and that feeds into arguably the most important aspect of the game, combat and exploration. Unlike other ARPGs such as Diablo or Path of Exile, No Rest for the Wicked embraces another genre, Souls-like, and we see that almost immediately in the game's animation-driven combat. Unlike other ARPGs, don't expect to fight hordes of uninteresting enemies because that's the exact opposite approach the team is taking here. Instead, you'll find yourself fighting one or two enemies with distinct movesets that need to be studied and internalized because your success will depend on how well you can react to their actions. It's not about simply enduring the onslaught of attacks, but instead blocking, dodging, or parrying them. On the flip side, the same Souls-like principles apply. Using the right weapon, understanding proper spacing, and of course, having impeccable timing, knowing when to attack and when to lay off. This is doubly true of the game's bosses, and while we've only seen one, Warwick the Torn, it's crystal clear that Moon Studios is taking their incredible boss design from the Ori games and injecting just enough of that soul's intensity to really make these encounters stand out. I expect many of the game's boss fights to be designed this way and at a caliber we've come to know from the Moon Studios team. You're going to start noticing a lot of similarities to Souls games as we keep talking about the action in No Rest for the Wicked, but it's not a true one-to-one -one comparison. Like I said before, the game pulls from a variety of genres and experiences, so don't let the Souls label turn you off, because I think that's only a fraction of what this game will ultimately end up being. One thing that will feel familiar to ARPG fans is how loot is handled, and let me just set the table right now. No Rest for the Wicked is a classless, loot-driven game. Your weapons will dictate your playstyle, and your armor and inventory will mandate how you dodge. With a light load, you'll be able to quick step, which is a more direct and offensive type of dodge. With a medium load, you'll be able to dodge roll, something I think everyone is familiar with. With a heavy load, we can only speculate since we haven't seen it ourselves, but anticipate either a small dodge step or even possibly a flop. With weapons, things are again familiar, yet different enough to be unique. White weapons are common, and the developers urge us not to think of them as boring, but instead the most customizable. How we can customize them? Well, it's not clear just yet. Blue items are rare and only have positive enchantments on them. Purple items are where things get interesting. They are cursed and feature very positive enchantments, but also a negative enchantment. Finally, there's gold items, which are unique and entirely handcrafted by the developers and offer unique enchantments. As a point of conversation, I think gold items will be the ones everyone wants to hunt down. Handcrafted items tailor-made by the dev team? Yes, please. That being said, here's where loot gets interesting. According to the developers, all loot in No Rest for the Wicked is randomly generated. That means a treasure chest in my game is going to have something completely different in your game. That's not to say there won't potentially be some instances of fixed loot, say on a key boss fight, but as far as we're concerned, everything will be random. Every item also has a chance to drop with a rune, which can be extracted and used on another weapon. Rune attacks require focus, another resource outside of stamina 
but provide that additional flexibility to tailor your playstyle. If you choose to use magic, something we still don't know much about, runes will dictate what spells that you can cast. Gear, on the other hand, and as far as we know right now, shape a lot of the player's experience, and we have seen what stats will ultimately drive our progression. In general, we have health, stamina, stamina regen, focus, and focus gain. I want to pause and focus on focus for just a second, because it powers every weapon's unique ability. While stamina dictates your ability to attack and dodge, your focus allows you to tap into those special abilities, and they're all different depending on the type of weapon and runes that you're using. On the defensive side of things, stats are straightforward and familiar. Armor, poise, heat resistance, cold resistance, electric resistance, and plague resistance. You also have your max weight and current weight, which is dynamic based on the gear that you're carrying in your inventory and the armor that you're wearing. And remember, this dictates the type of dodge roll that you will have access to. Part of your character's progression will be tied to gear. That's a no-brainer. But it's also tied to an attribute system. Every time you level up, you'll be able to put points into the following categories. Health, Stamina, Strength, Dexterity, Intelligence, Faith, Focus, and Equip Load. This is all relatively straightforward with attributes like Strength, Dexterity, Intelligence, and Faith pushing your power with certain weapons higher, while things like Health, Stamina, Focus, and Equipment Load provide that necessary sustain and utility. Eventually, after you're done exploring and pushing through the first boss, you'll arrive at Sacrament, the main city at the center of Isola Sakura's story. Not only will this act as your main hub, filled with shops and vendors that can buy, sell, and enhance gear, but it'll also be integral to the developer's approach to a living world. Yes, Sacrament features a number of systems you might otherwise find in a game, like Animal Crossing. First, what you'd expect, a number of shops where you can buy, sell, and upgrade. And thanks to a fantastic article in a recent edition of Game Informer, we know exactly who and what players can expect to find in Sacrament on day one. Fillmore the blacksmith sells and upgrades weapon and armor. Whitaker the woodcrafter sells furniture for home decorations. More on that shortly. Mirabelle and Meriwether the tailors sell cloth and light armor. Frenick the merchant is the general shopkeeper where you can purchase and sell goods. Gordon the Cook sells dishes and ingredients. Finley, the rare item merchant, visits Sacrament on Saturday and sells expensive, exclusive, and enchanted items you can't find anywhere else. Eleanor, the enchantress, enchants gear with magical effects, such as elemental buffs, and sells runes that, when equipped in appropriate gear, add those additional abilities. Marcos, the alchemist, sells potions, bombs, and other projectiles. Maker Donos, the builder, improves town infrastructure and creates shortcuts within Sacrament. Randolph, captain of the guard, offers various bounties and challenges, and Caroline the innkeeper provides special beds that grant beneficial status effects. If you think that's a lot, hold on because two additional vendors, Wilhelm the farmer and Boroth the arena master, are also said to be coming in an update after the early access launch. NPCs that offer wares and services are one thing, but No Rest for the Wicked takes that a step further and offers players the chance at a fully customizable homestead. Again, think Animal Crossing, but with a dark fantasy world corrupted by a plague, and you've got the gist. This is still part of the game that's shrouded in a bit of secrecy ahead of early access launch, but we know that one of the hallmarks of the system is the lack of a grid. Every inch of your homestead, which can be purchased at some point in the game, can be designed organically with very little restriction. Inside, you'll be able to craft, purchase, and place functional items like shelves and containers where you can store loot. There will also be refinement and crafting stations of a set it and forget it variety where you can turn raw materials into refined materials or craft whatever item you're looking for. Then, of course, there are the cosmetics that make your house feel like a home. Truthfully, this is an element of the game I just didn't expect, and based on the limited footage we've seen of the system, it looks to be just as impressive as you'd hope to see from this team providing both function and form. Having your own homestead means you'll need a flow of resources, not only to outfit your house, but to enhance your gear as well. Believe it or not, No Rest for the Wicked also has MMO-style gathering. Once you find an axe, you can chop down trees. Pickaxe in hand, you can mine some ore, and there's even fishing and cooking, and while we haven't seen much from these systems, it's just another thing you wouldn't necessarily expect from an ARPG. I think all of this makes No Rest for the Wicked interesting, because that blending of genres and systems gives the game more depth than you'd expect from something typical in this space. You've got Moon Studios' breathtaking world building, the likes of which only they can do. 
intentional soul style combat, gathering and crafting a la an MMO, and then a town building and homestead system like a social simulator. It's almost shocking how much the team has managed to pack into this experience. That being said, there is still a lot we don't know about this game, and even the vertical slice of No Rest for the Wicked that some players had a chance to experience only offered a glimpse of what's to come when the game releases into early access on April 18th. We know that after launch, we could expect at least two major updates before the inevitable 1.0 release. In that first post-launch patch, multiplayer will be added. The team plans to implement four-player co-op on cloud-hosted realms where progression is shared. It's also said that players will be able to engage in some sort of PvP, but that's shrouded in a bit of mystery. In the second post-launch patch, the team says new regions, enemies, and story will be added. Finally, the 1.0 release will coincide with the game coming to consoles, which I truly hope will blow open the doors on the attention this game gets. There is so much more to No Rest for the Wicked, and I truly hope we can dive into all of it together in the near future. With the game's early access release right around the corner, let us know what you think of Moon Studios' new project. Leave us a comment down below, and of course, if you like our Ultimate Previews and you want more videos like this in your feed, do me a solid, hit that thumbs up, and of course, consider subscribing. My name is Kodiak, and from everyone here at Legacy Gaming, thanks for watching, and play on.